It is good to be with you tonight. I hope you are all doing well. I thank you so much to those of you who have called or emailed or messaged with prayer concerns and updates over the past several days. I appreciate that. As always, if you have something that we need to be praying about, uh, please get in touch. You can call or text the church phone number, which is 608-224-0274, or preferred would be my personal cell phone if you have it, or you can send a message through the church website or to the church email at fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear what we need to be praying about as a congregation or as an eldership. Just let me know. Uh, we've not yet decided what we plan on doing for worship this coming Lord's Day, and so please stay tuned for that. We'll let you know we do want to come together for worship, uh, but we also want to be safe. There's a lot going on out there right now, so we'll be talking about that the next few days, and we'll get in touch soon concerning what we plan on doing this coming Sunday and for the Sundays coming forward. Uh, thank you, by the way, to Gary and Elijah and Scott for showing up at church this past Sunday to get some things ready for the winter over there. Uh, we mowed and weed whacked and trimmed bushes. We took care of some leaves. We cleaned the gutters. We got the hoses put away, got the salt ready for the sidewalks, uh, got some furnace filters swapped out, uh, fixed some downspouts and window well covers. It's actually a lot more than I thought. Um, I was writing that down, thinking about what we did in just about an hour and a half or two hours or so Sunday afternoon. We accomplished quite a bit in that short amount of time. And so got a lot uh, got a lot of things done, ready for winter over there. So thanks very much to you guys for helping us out uh, in this way. Tonight we are continuing in our pause in studying the book of Luke. And we're looking at another resource uh, for studying with those who would like to know more about the Christian faith. Several weeks ago, you may remember, we looked at a worksheet that uh, we titled Learn From Me, and we used that study as some structure uh, for introducing somebody to Jesus. Before we yoke up with Jesus, we need to know who he is. And so, a few weeks ago, we looked at a series of scriptures introducing us to the Lord, or introducing the person that we're studying with to the Lord. Hopefully all of us know the Lord. Uh, but we're doing this in order to teach others. That's been the purpose of looking at these worksheets. Uh, then last week, we looked at those 14 statements under the heading, What Do the Scriptures Teach? And we had those blank check boxes. Uh, we're saved by grace, we're saved by mercy, we're saved by words, and so on. And then we looked at that worksheet as well as a resource for teaching somebody who thinks that baptism doesn't save us. That's a common belief out there by many in the religious world that we're not saved by baptism. And so by looking at those passages in this way, we learn that when something in the New Testament is, is described as saving us, we don't get to choose between those things. We don't get to say, I think I'm saved by grace and truth, but not mercy and so on. But we have to take everything together. We have to add up what the Bible teaches. We don't get to choose between these. And so we're taking everything that the Bible teaches together. Uh, multiple things are described as saving us in Scripture, and we need to uh, add all of these together instead of choosing one or the other. Well, this week I want us to look at another resource. This time we're doing pretty much a quick overview of what we do when we come together, when we assemble together for a church for worship. And this is a sheet that we've looked at a time or two through the years. It has been a while since we've studied it in a class format. And it's a valuable tool because as we study with somebody who's interested in learning more about the Lord's Church, this pretty much summarizes what we actually do when we come together for worship. And some of these things make us quite distinct from many others in the rest of the religious world. And so there's a value to going through this. So somebody knows what they're getting into. If they want to know who we are and what we do and what makes us different from the religious world, uh, this would certainly be one way of doing that. I've put a link to this worksheet in the description of the YouTube video. I've also attached it to an email that went out. I've put a link in the Facebook live stream group. I've actually mailed out uh, hard copies to our members who join us on the phone every week. I sent it out on Monday. Um, so you may or may not have it by now, depending on how fast the mail's working these days. But it should be on its way. If you don't have it, it should get there probably, hopefully soon. Uh, if you would like a copy of this worksheet and don't have it yet, please let me know, and I'll do whatever it takes to get it to you. Uh, but hopefully you have it in front of you in some format, maybe on a device, hopefully on paper. I know I've heard a few comments the last couple weeks where people appreciate being able to take notes and follow along and keep up in that way. 
And the reason is we're studying this so that we can be ready to use this as a resource for teaching others. And so we have some structure to our study. We've got some of the key passages listed here. Definitely, absolutely not everything by any means, but these are the highlights. And we might go through this uh, not just to teach, but also to open up potential uh, questions for discussion. I know so many times uh, some of the best studies that we've had through the years have been in response to questions. And so we'll start studying something and somebody will say, well, what about this? And it's a, it's a bizarre question and, and yet it's a good question. And so we'll dig into that and we'll go from there. And so as we study this with somebody, they might have some good questions. And I think that brings us the reminder uh, we don't always need to have the perfect answer for every uh, weird question that somebody might ask. And, and what I mean by that is, if we read a passage and, and somebody asks us the question, um, it's okay to say, I don't know, isn't it? It's, it's okay to say that. Uh, obviously, that's a whole lot better than giving a wrong answer, uh, especially on spiritual matters. But it's perfectly uh, fine to respond, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. Let me get back to you on that. Let me look into that. Let me study that some more and I'll be glad to get back to you. And at least in my experience, it seems that people appreciate that a whole lot more uh, than just us making something up or pretending that we know more than we do. If somebody asks us something we don't know, it's all right to admit that. And it's all right, I'll, I'll get back to you on that and we'll study that next week. And I say this because not knowing how to answer potential questions is one of the big reasons why many people hate or hesitate uh, to study the Bible with people. Uh, many times it's fear, fear of not knowing something, fear of getting stumped, uh, fear of looking stupid or incompetent. Uh, but the answer is we admit that we don't know. And then we do some more study. Maybe we go and we ask in private somebody who we think maybe knows more than we do. Maybe we find a good article, a good resource, a website a link and then we come back to our friend a week or so later and we answer that question and we pick up with where we left off. So I just say that by way of reminder. So with this in mind, let's go through the worksheet and I want us to notice we start with what we might consider a theme verse for this study. John chapter 4 verse 24. In John 4, of course, uh, Jesus meets with the Samaritan woman who had come to a well to get water. They have this conversation the conversation turns to worship. And I think that's a reminder for us, the value of doing a study like this. A lot of times people have questions about worship, uh, the right way to worship, the right place to worship, and so on. And in that conversation, Jesus says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Again, that's John 4.24. It's not the main point of the whole chapter. But that verse gives some insight into what it means to worship God acceptably. Worship is to be from the heart. It is to be in spirit. And yet it must also be according to truth, according to the word of God. As many of us know from personal experience, from people we know and love, from groups that we're familiar with, uh, worship certainly has the potential of going off the rails in either direction. We can worship in spirit and get in trouble by ignoring the truth part, but we can also be so concerned with the truth part that we forget to actually worship from the heart or in spirit. And so I think all of us understand, hopefully we would agree, that spirit and truth are both important in terms of worshiping God. We worship in spirit and also in truth. And as with our study uh, recently, we don't get to choose between these two, but it's a matter of taking both of these together. And so as we work our way through this study, we'll be considering our part, the spirit part, uh, as well as the truth part in terms of exactly what God has instructed. And in no particular order, let's start with the Lord's Supper. Obviously, when an outsider comes into one of our worship assemblies on a Sunday morning, the Lord's Supper plays a prominent role. And so the first question here is, according to Matthew 26, 26 through 29, what elements are involved in the Lord's Supper and why? In Matthew 26, we have Jesus explaining the Lord's Supper for the first time. Uh, this is on the night before he dies as they're eating the Passover meal. Uh, Matthew 26, 26 through 29, and we'll also throw in verse 30 here as well. So I'm not sticking very closely to the scriptures that are listed. We'll add a few here and there. But let's look at Matthew 26, 26 through 30. Matthew 26, 26 through 30. 
While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So the question is, what are the elements that are involved in the Lord's Supper? Obviously, we read this paragraph, we have bread in verse 26, and then we also have the fruit of the vine referred to in verse 29. Back up in verse 17 that we did not read, we find that this takes place during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so we add a few things together. We, I think, safely assume this bread is unleavened. Paul actually also refers to the bread being unleavened in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, just in a passing reference on a completely different subject. Uh, you may be aware that some religious groups today use regular bread, um, wonder bread, as I would uh, describe it. Uh, some use water instead of fruit of the vine. I can think of at least one major religious group that does that. Um, most of us are aware that some religious groups have the priest do the fruit of the vine and the people do the bread. And so that's another variation on that. But in this passage, as Jesus explains the Lord's Supper for the first time, he describes both the bread, the unleavened bread, and the fruit of the vine. Well, the next question here is why? What do these elements represent? And Jesus explains it, doesn't he? The bread represents his body and the fruit of the vine represents his blood. I would point out here, notice he says, this is my body, and this is my blood. But uh, since he's right there with them, uh, this is obviously symbolic. The bread and the fruit of the vine are not literally the Lord's body and blood, uh, but they represent his body and his blood. And I say that because he's standing there. There were not pieces of his body disappearing uh, as he was explaining this and as they were partaking of this supper. I included verse 30 tonight, by the way, because it is so close to exactly what we've been doing here in Madison during the pandemic. We partake of the Lord's Supper, we sing a hymn together, and then we leave, don't we? And that is exactly what Jesus and the apostles did here. Worship is very, very simple, and we see that reflected in verse 30. As we move on to 1B on our sheet tonight, uh, notice the question is, according to 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, what is the purpose of the Lord's Supper? And tonight I'm including a couple more verses uh, going through verse 28 just to give a bit more context here. Uh, by the way, we might not realize this, but this passage was probably written actually before the passage we just read in Matthew. And so this is perhaps the first written instructions the early Christians had because Paul writes before Matthew was written. So notice, please, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 28. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so Paul is referring here back to what happened in that passage that we just read from Matthew. But again, he's probably writing uh, time-wise before Matthew actually writes. And he can do this because notice, according to verse 23, he didn't get this information from Matthew, did he? He didn't get this from Mark, Luke, or John. He got this from the Lord himself. I receive from the Lord what I deliver to you. And so this is not secondhand information. This comes from Jesus to Paul, and now he's passing it on. As to the purpose of the Lord's Supper, according to Paul, he says we do it to remember. And so we remember Jesus, we remember his body, we remember the blood that was shed, that was poured out for us. 
Uh, by the way, just another reminder here that the language is obviously symbolic in some sense. Uh, what are we told to drink? We're told to drink the cup. Do we actually drink a cup? I've never uh, drunk a cup. Um, I've, I've had what's in the cup. <laughs> And so I think we're just reminded here, this is a figure of speech. We drink what's in a cup. We don't actually drink the cup itself. The cup uh, is a reference to what's in the cup, the fruit of the vine. And so the purpose of the supper is to remember the Lord's death. And by doing this, we not only remember, I would also point out here, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So there is an inward focus, but there's also an outward focus. We are telling other people what the Lord has done for us when we partake of the Lord's Supper. And I also see a reference to the future here. Um, he's coming back for us because we do this until he comes. And so whenever we meet together and partake of the Lord's Supper, um, we have a forward-looking supper in addition to a backward-looking supper and an inward-looking memorial. Every day, every Lord's Day, we are one week closer to his return. Uh, and since we sometimes have questions about whether we are worthy to partake of the supper, um, I've also included verses 27 and 28 here. I know I've mentioned before, uh, years ago, I noticed two women down in Janesville weren't partaking of the Lord's Supper. And I try not to, you know, I'm trying to focus on myself, right? But, I mean, you you look around and you the tray has passed by somebody and they're not partaking. And I know that person's a Christian. And so they should be. And I, I think I waited a couple weeks just to make sure I didn't misunderstand or uh, just misobserve something. But sure enough, that these two ladies were not partaking of the Lord's Supper. So I pulled them aside afterwards and asked them about it. And they said, well, we can't partake of the Supper because we're not worthy. We aren't worthy of partaking of the Lord's Supper. Well, that's concerning, isn't it? And so we open up this passage and really we learn that we'll never be worthy of partaking of the Lord's Supper, will we? Uh, if, I'm th if I think I'm worthy of partaking of the supper, as in, God, I'm partaking of this because I deserve what you did for me, uh, that's a bad place in which to be. We don't want to go there. And so we studied this passage, and, and we learned that we are to partake, not that we ourselves are worthy, but we are to partake in a worthy manner. And so we're not the ones who have to be worthy of partaking. It is the manner in which we partake that is to be worthy. And that is something that we can control. And so the manner in which we partake the supper is to be a worthy manner. In other words, we examine ourselves and we think about what we're doing. We don't treat it like a common meal as the Corinthians had been doing. Uh, in the verses leading up to this passage, by the way, we, we just don't have time tonight to look into that. But Paul rebukes these people for uh, getting full on the supper while the poor people went away with nothing. And he severely rebukes them for that. That is the unworthy manner that we are to be concerned about here. And so we will never be deserving in that sense of what God has done for us. We aren't worthy of the supper, but it is, it is the manner in which we partake of the supper uh, that needs to be worthy. And so we need to partake not just in spirit, but also in truth. And I think we see how those two thoughts merge here. Uh, let's keep on going then to letter C here. According to the example set in Troas in Acts 20, verse 7, how often did the early Christians partake of the Lord's Supper? In context, Paul is just uh, traveling through this area. He's in a rush to deliver some famine relief to the church in Jerusalem. But he sticks around a number of days, almost a week, for the purpose of being with this congregation in Troas for worship. Uh, notice how Luke, the author, describes this. In Acts 20, verse 7, he says, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. And so we notice in this passage that the early church gathered together for the purpose of breaking bread on the first day of the week. We'll get back to this when we look at our giving, but this is the first day of every week. This is not just once a year. This is not just one once a quarter. This is not just whenever we feel like it. This isn't Sunday uh, plus weddings and funerals and special occasions or anything like that. But the early church was in the habit of meeting together for the purpose of partaking of the Lord's Supper on the first day 
of every week. We have an example set for us here. Uh, remember, the special day under the law of Moses was not the first day of the week. The special day under Moses' law was the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. But the special day under the new covenant is the day of the Lord's resurrection, the day the church was established, the first day of every week. That's why we get together on Sunday, not on Saturday. And so in summary, we partake the Lord's Supper with the bread representing Jesus' body, with the fruit of the vine representing the Lord's blood. Uh, we do this in our, uh, his memory. We do this examining ourselves, and we do it on the first day of every week. All right, let's move on to singing, to the second act of worship on our sheet, singing. And the first question here is, according to Ephesians 5.19, how is our singing described? And to give just a bit more context, I'm uh, widening that up to verses 18 through 20. So Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. Notice the words of Paul. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father. There are a few things we should note here, uh, starting with the fact that our singing uh, seems to be really the opposite of getting drunk, doesn't it? And so instead of getting drunk, we're not to do that. That's what the world does. We don't get drunk. We don't even head in that direction. Instead of doing that, instead of going in that direction, we as God's people are to sing. And we are not to be filled with wine. We are to be filled with the Spirit. And we do this through the songs that we sing. Uh, as to our question, singing is described as speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So when we sing, we use actual words. Uh, we aren't beatboxing. We aren't uh, howling like animals. Uh, most of us, anyway, are not howling like animals. Uh, but we are communicating to one another using actual words that make sense. I kind of just added that just now, words that make sense. If we don't know what a word is, we need to figure it out really before we sing it. A night with ebon pinion brooded o'er the veil. What in the world is that talking about? If we don't know, uh, that's a song. Maybe the song leader needs to explain before we sing it together because we're teaching and admonishing uh, through actual words that make sense uh, to those who are gathered together for worship. Notice here, uh, we're giving thanks to God. Uh, we do this in the Lord's name, by his authority. Um, so as with prayer that we'll get to in a minute, uh, singing is also uh, done in the name of the Lord in a sense. Um, so as to our uh, question here, singing is, is speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And so we do this in spirit and also in truth, according uh, to the word of God. Oh, we have a parallel passage over in the book of Colossians. So let's look at Colossians chapter 3. Uh, and let's look at verses 16 and 17. We just hate to cut off verse 17 there. It's a good verse. Uh, don't want to whack it. And so uh, Colossians 3 verses 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Again, the word of Christ dwells within us through singing. Um, I, I'm worried that we've been singing less during the pandemic, haven't we? I don't know about you, um, I'm singing less during the pandemic than I used to. Uh, when we got together, we would sing six or seven songs as a congregation. Right now, we're singing one. Um, and I'm not sure how to fix that. I, we need to be singing on our own, in small groups, um, with our families. I know according to the experts, singing seems to be risky. That's We're slinging it, aren't we? We're, we're singing. We're, we're spreading stuff when we sing. We are projecting. We're, we're shooting air and everything that comes with it. And yet there are some spiritual benefits to singing together as God's people. Uh, we also have the reminder here that we teach through the songs that we sing, very similar to what we saw over in Ephesians. We teach and admonish. And so I would point out here, if we teach and admonish, we had better make sure that our songs are accurate, 
spiritually solid, good messages, good material based on the Word of God. Um, we also need to realize at the same time that most of our songs are not inspired, are they? We do have songs that are inspired. We need more inspired songs. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, for example. That song is directly from Scripture. You cannot go wrong with that. Um, but the way I look at it, if a song can be taken in a right way or a wrong way, let's do everything we can to take it in the right way. If it's possible to give the author the benefit of the doubt, and if it's not outright error, um, we can allow some, some leeway there. There is something, of, of course, known as poetic license. Uh, some songs are outright wrong and spiritually dangerous. We should not be singing those. Uh, but again, if we can assume the best of an author, if there is some way that we can sing with a clean conscience, let's do that. Uh, realizing, again, that most of our songs are not inspired. Um, I've mentioned before, I remember attending a gospel meeting at a church over in Iowa. And most or many of the songs in their songbooks had X's through them. Um, with a little statement, do not sing, unscriptural song. And, and one of those songs that was X'd out was Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me. There was a, an X through the song number, and there was a note that said, Do not sing Calvinist. And I, as I was there, I, I sat dumbfounded. I couldn't pay attention to the sermon. I was so distracted by Jesus loves me being a banned song. And I have still, to this day, not figured out how Jesus loves me teaches Calvinism. But uh, I, I will continue to sing that song until somebody convinces me otherwise. I'm sure maybe there's something in there that could be taken in a wrong way. But if there's some way I can sing that song with a clean conscience, without teaching something that's wrong, uh, I, I will continue to sing it, realizing it was not written by Peter, Paul, or Jesus. It was written... Um, by a woman back in 19 or 1860 something and then adapted by uh, William Bradbury, I believe. Um, but again, uninspired authors, they're not perfect, but uh, I, I think you get the point there. Let's be careful with the songs that we sing. Uh, we teach and admonish through the singing we do, and so we need to be sure that we are actually teaching and admonishing accurately. Uh, we also find with the passage or as with the passage in Ephesians that we thank God through the songs that we sing. Thanksgiving is, is a theme of our singing. And so our songs are aimed at each other. That's the teaching part of it. But our songs are also aimed at God, the thanksgiving part of it. And I believe we could also say our songs are aimed outwardly. Um, outsiders coming into our assembly should be able uh, to learn something about God. And I think that's an accurate thing. I think you could go through the songbooks that we use. And you could teach somebody exactly what they need to do to be saved based on the singing that we do. And I, I've looked at our books with that in mind, and I think that's an, an accurate thing to say. Okay, let's keep on moving on singing. Uh, one more here, letter C. Uh, according to Hebrews 13, 15, what instrument are we to use to praise God? And again, to give just a bit more context, I'm including another extra verse here. Uh, Hebrews 13, 15, and 16. Hebrews 13, 15, and 16. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. And so, with reference to Jesus, the author of Hebrews says that through him, we offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. And he describes our praise as the fruit of lips that give praise to his name. The instrument we use in our praise of God is our lips. And we won't go too deep with this tonight, but when God tells us to praise him in the new covenant, he tells us to sing. He just says sing. And as we understand it, we don't have his permission to praise him with instruments as opposed to the way it was under the law of Moses. And I know people will often go back to the old to uh, try to justify using instruments in worship Let's realize there are many things from the old that we don't carry over into the new. Uh, the use of incense in worship, for example. The sacrifice of animals, keeping the Sabbath as a holy day, and, and on and on and on. So if we just look at what the New Testament teaches concerning worship in the Lord's church, he tells us to sing. And so as God's people, we do that. And we do the best that we can not to add to it or take away from it. I added verse 16 here as a reminder, if we're really interested in pleasing God, 
uh, we do good and share because we know that, that with these sacrifices, God is pleased. We're always on solid ground when we do good and share. So I guess I could put another plug in here for the uh, oh cookie mix and brownie mix and uh, cake mix for Schultz Lewis Child and Family Services. December 6th is the deadline, and that's uh, an absolutely good, positive, wonderful thing that we can do for, uh, for some teenagers who don't have families of their own who are able to take care of them. And uh, we've had some great opportunities also to do this through the pandemic. But I just put that in there because uh, the author of Hebrews includes it here. All right, let's keep moving over to prayer. And the first question is, according to Matthew 9, 9 through 13, to whom should we pray? And then also, what are some possible topics in our prayers? And this is in what we usually refer to as the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew 6, 9 through 13, the words of Jesus. Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So back to our questions. To whom should we pray? Obviously, we direct our prayers to God the Father. Our Father in heaven is how Jesus starts this sample prayer here. And then, what are some possible topics in our prayers? Notice Jesus in this passage does not say, pray this prayer. It's not how he starts here. It doesn't say, pray this prayer. In other words, this is not an actual prayer to be prayed. This is a pattern this is not to be repeated word for word. This is a pattern or an example of a prayer. Uh, by the way, in the two verses immediately before this sample prayer, Jesus had just said in verses 7 and 8, And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And then he goes on and says, pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven. So it's always interesting to me. This prayer that is often mindlessly repeated, meaningless repetition, comes right after two verses of Jesus warning us not to do that. Anyway, so we're not to pray this actual prayer. This is not something we repeat over and over. Um, and so in terms of a pattern, it seems that instead of praying the actual prayer, it seems to me we have some categories here, some things that we need to be praying about. One category I find here in this prayer is we praise God, and, and that's how Jesus starts it. And generally speaking, we, we need to do more of that. Often prayer is asking God for things, but uh, there is absolutely room for us praising God, especially when we begin our prayers. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed or holy, separate from us, be your name. Um, we can pray for God's kingdom. We know the kingdom today is the church. We are God's kingdom on this earth, and so we pray for his kingdom. Uh, he says, your kingdom come. At this point, the coming of the kingdom seems to still be in the future. Those references to the kingdom before Acts 2 are pointing to the future. After Acts 2, it's something that we have been added to already. And so it seems to have started in a sense, have been established in a sense on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. But we can still pray for his kingdom, for the health of the church, for the growth of the church, and so on. Uh, we pray for God's will to be done. That's something we need to be praying about. We pray for our daily bread, our daily necessities, the things that we need to live and survive. We ask for forgiveness uh, there at the end. And, and again, not these actual words, but these are some ideas for things that we need to be praying about. A, a sample prayer. So uh, pray like this instead of pray this prayer would be maybe one way of summarizing that. Okay, let's move on to uh, letter B in the outline under prayer. And we have the question, according to John 14, 13 and 14, in whose name should we pray? And so Jesus is speaking here, John 14, verses 13 and 14. And he says, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And so in answering our question, we pray in Jesus' name. And again, I would suggest this is not some kind of a formula. This is not some kind of a magic word that needs to be included in our prayers for those prayers to count. Um, but when we go to God in prayer, we do need to approach him in the name of Jesus. That means by the Lord's authority, understanding that Jesus makes our prayers possible. 
We pray to the Father through Jesus. Jesus is our advocate, our attorney, our counselor, as we've learned recently from 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. So again, going back, I think it was to the, at least to the songs that we sing. We, we sing in Jesus' name. That doesn't mean every song that we sing, we have to end it with, in Jesus' name we sing. Uh, but it's the idea of doing it by the Lord's authority, uh, by his permission. Okay, let's keep moving to letter C here. Um, and there's so much more we could say on prayer. But let's look at C before we move on. The question is, according to Acts 8, 18 through 24, for what should we pray? So we've got another example here of something to pray about. And this is a passage concerning the growth of the church in Samaria, that territory up north of Jerusalem. As the church grows, they hit some trouble. They get some growing pangs. There, there's a guy there they have some issues with. That guy has some issues. We're going to see that here. Acts 8, 18 through 24. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. And so in terms of what we need to be praying for, according to this passage, obviously, forgiveness. When we sin we feel guilty <laughs> and when we violate the law of god the conscience tells us we've done something wrong and here uh, this man had to be called out on it in order to understand what he had done now when that happens when we feel guilty when we're convicted of sin we don't need to be rebaptized every time that's that's a good question i've had through the years do i need to be rebaptized well it kind of depends doesn't it some people think if they do a really big sin, they need to be rebaptized. I would just point out that's not what Peter recommends here. If we've already obeyed the gospel, if we're already a child of God, we don't get rebaptized. We're already in. And so we need to keep turning back to God and asking for his forgiveness when we sin. And this is a good example of something we might pray about together as a congregation. This event here in Acts 8 seems to be somewhat public. So here's this man, and, and he's overwhelmed with guilt for what he's done. And he almost feels unworthy himself to offer this prayer, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> to me, it's almost like, I need an apostle. This is an apostle-level prayer here. I need somebody else to pray on my behalf. Um, we know from James that God hears the prayer, the, the, righteous, the prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And he wasn't feeling very righteous at this moment. And so there are times when we might need to call on somebody else uh, to pray on our behalf. So I would just add that to uh, the, the prayer category here. Okay, let's move over to giving. And the first question is, according to 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, what did Paul teach concerning the frequency and the amount of our contribution? So let's look at 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. So how often do we give? What's the frequency? Notice, we give, we set aside on the first day of every week. And the reason is, so Paul doesn't have to organize some special contribution when he passes through town. This is not a panic situation, but the church has regular expenses, we have plans, we, we carry out, we execute those plans, finances are needed, so it's not a a panic situation every time something comes due, but we give on a regular basis. There is to be some order and some regularity to our giving. We give on the first day of the week. Uh, but what if I get paid daily? What if I get paid every other week? What if I get paid monthly? What if I get paid yearly? What if I get paid sporadically? Okay, now we're talking about numbers, and you know I hate numbers. <laughs> Um, in my humble opinion, numbers and words should never mix. Um, but, but here, you know, I, I just want to point out there could be some minor math involved. And uh, even I have been able to figure this out through the years. But in order to give on a weekly basis, you know, we get paid in different ways in our family. Um, I get paid weekly. My wife gets paid monthly. 
but even there it's fairly easy to figure out you know you get paid monthly you you know multiply that by 12 divide it by 52 you've got a weekly amount you figure the percentage you want to give and then you go and figure uh, your income and it, it's really quite easy to do there may be some minor math involved um, I have faith in us. We can do this. <laughs> we can figure it out and uh, get help. You know, call on somebody for support and uh, whip out the calculator or whatever. And our family, this is something it's good to talk about um, on a regular basis. Um, but the point is, we give on the first day of every week. And if we get paid monthly, we don't give monthly. We figure that out and we divide it out and we give on the first day of every week. Um, by the way, I do find it interesting that religious groups who can't figure out that we need to observe the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week have somehow figured that we need to give on the first day of every week. I mean, how strange that is. You know, they'll pass the basket every week, but they won't do the Lord's Supper every week. And yet the same terminology is used. So strange how that works. Uh, but the frequency of both is the same. And the reason is the early church was in the habit of coming together. They assembled as the church on the first day of every week. That's why those things happen at that time. Uh, the other question concerns the amount of our giving. How much? Paul says every person is to give as he may prosper. Well, how much is that? It depends, doesn't it? It would have been so easy for Paul to say 10% or 2% or 3 Thirty percent. This would have been the place for him to plug that in, but he doesn't do that, does he? Under the new covenant, we do not have a percentage that is demanded of us, like a tax. Uh, it's interesting to me that all of us will give a percentage. Let's just realize that also. If I give a dollar, it is a percentage of something, isn't it? If I give a thousand dollars every week, that also is a percentage. Uh, but the percentage is not dictated under the new covenant. Uh, just an observation here, generally speaking, does the New Covenant raise or lower the standard that we live by as opposed to the old law? Well, we think about what Jesus said over in Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you, generally speaking, did Jesus lower the bar or raise the bar? Uh, he, he raised it, didn't he? You've heard that you're not supposed to murder, but I say to you, whoever gets angry at his brother, he made it more difficult or more stringent, we might say. And so personally, I, I just can't imagine the early Christians saying, uh, yes, you know, uh, we're now under the new covenant. Jesus died for our sins. We can now lower our giving from 10% to 2%. I, mean, in, in my, I just can't imagine um, anybody in the first century saying, I just can't picture that. Uh, but as to the amount, I, I'm, we're on firm ground here. No percentage is given. Uh, but instead, we are to give as we have prospered. And God leaves the amount up to us. All right, let's continue looking at B here on our worksheet. We come to the question, according to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, uh, what example did Jesus set concerning our giving? Some of you may remember, uh, this is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. I had a friend, Clyde Slimp. Uh, introduced this verse to me many, many years ago. It was on his business card. He gave me his business card, and I'm like, I've never seen that verse before. And I know I had seen the verse before, but it just hit me in a way uh, that stuck with me. So my favorite verse, and this is right in the middle of two chapters on giving, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. So what example did Jesus set concerning our giving? He gave everything. He gave up the riches of heaven to come to this earth to save us, to be born into a life of poverty and pain. And so anything that we do in response to that absolutely pales in comparison. Let's look at one more on giving uh, to letter C on our worksheet. Uh, we come to the question, according to 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7, what is God's law of sowing and reaping? And also, what should our attitude be while giving? So 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So what's God's law of sowing and reaping? Well, it goes back to the beginning. We reap what we sow. 
If we sow just a little, we harvest a little. If we sow much, we reap much. If we sow bad seed, we get a bad crop. If we sow good seed, we get a good crop, and so on. And here Paul applies this to our giving. Uh, but the other part of this um, is our attitude. We are to give cheerfully. God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, we can give a whole lot of money with a bad attitude, and God is completely, absolutely unimpressed by that. He can be offended by that. You can give God a lot of money with a bad attitude, and he, he doesn't care. Um, he's turned off by that. And so as we give, let's be thinking about it. Let's not forget that. And I know we talk about examining ourselves as we partake of the Lord's Supper, but it also seems that we should probably examine ourselves as we give as well. As with other acts of worship, there's a danger to getting stuck in a rut without thinking about it. And so my wife and I have this conversation about how much we're giving back in December as we get ready for the new year. Uh, we change the amount and it's kind of automatic. We're on autopilot here. We don't think about it every week. That's a danger is what I'm saying here. Uh, because as we give on a weekly basis, we need to be thinking about it and we need to be giving uh, with a cheerful heart. There is so much more we could say about all of these, but let's wrap it up this morning with preaching to number five here. And the first question here is, according to 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, what is the work of an evangelist? Um, all right, so let's look at 2 Timothy 4, some of Paul's last words to the young preacher Timothy. Uh, the word preacher refers to somebody who makes an announcement. Um, it goes back to the old town crier, hear ye, hear ye. You know, two o'clock in the morning and all's well. He can't make up that message. It's not up to him to decide that. It's the king who sends him on a mission. So preacher is somebody who brings a message. Evangelist is someone who preaches the good news. And so it's a little more specific than preacher. Uh, minister, by the way, another term that's often used scripturally, I think, to apply to preachers, uh, simply means servant. It'd be the same background to the word deacon, but it, it does apply. The preacher serves in a sense. So those minister, preacher, evangelist are three terms we sometimes use interchangeably. So let's look at Paul's last words to a young preacher. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So what is the work of an evangelist? An evangelist, again, is someone who preaches the good news. Therefore, the work of an evangelist is to preach the good news. That is his number one responsibility comes above all else. Preachers must preach the gospel no matter what. As Marshall Keeble used to paraphrase this passage, they are to preach it when people like it, and they are to preach it when they don't. And I know it's tempting to adjust the message based on a changing culture, but we dare not change the divine message. We don't have God's permission to change it. We don't have that authority. But in terms of worship, preaching, or studying of the scriptures is definitely a part of what we do when the church comes together on the first day of every week. All right, let's keep moving. And we're in 2 Timothy a lot here because, again, this is a book written by a preacher to a preacher right before the older preacher dies. And so the question here is, according to 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26, what special task has been given to the evangelist? And again, Paul's last words before he's executed in Rome. 2 Timothy 4, 24 through 26. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So based on this passage, the preacher has been given the responsibility of correcting people. 
He needs to do this with gentleness, and he does this hoping that people will eventually come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. Uh, turning this around, we listen to preaching, hoping to be corrected, don't we? You know, this is from a preacher to a preacher. But if we're on the listening end of a sermon, if we're heading in the wrong direction, we want to hear about it. And we need to do the best that we can to listen with open hearts. The preacher also needs to be patient here. Uh, there's some times when somebody will call the preacher and say, well, you, blah, 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 you know, you did this or that and, and go off. And it's, it's very tempting to respond uh, in a similar way. But it's important for the preacher to stay calm, be kind to all, able to teach, and having this attitude that uh, he really wants this person to get those issues worked out so we can go to heaven, and that, that's our goal. Okay, the final question here. According to 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, what else must an evangelist do? Speaking of preaching here. Uh, so let's look at 2 Timothy 2, 2. Paul says this, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses... Entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So notice the preacher is also responsible for training others. He is to take this message that he has received and he is to turn around and entrust that message to others who will then be able to pass it along to others who can then pass it along to others and so on and so on until the end of time. And I find it interesting, this is pretty much what we're doing right now, isn't it? We've been looking at these worksheets, not primarily for our own benefit. This isn't so I have a better understanding of what we do in worship, primarily. But we're studying these worksheets these last few weeks to train ourselves uh, to be better able to use this material in teaching others. And so, again, I find it interesting that we're doing exactly what uh, Paul told Timothy to do here, passing this on in a way that others can pass it on as well. Okay, this brings us to the end of our study. I know it has been a topical study. We haven't studied a, a big chunk of the Bible. We haven't had time to look in depth at any of these passages, but we've given something of an overview concerning what we do in worship when we come together as a church, and we've uh, done this again. So we have another resource. When somebody comes to us, they want to know what we believe. They want to know about the Lord's church. This is one way of doing that. This is who we are. This is what we do when we assemble together. Uh, again, if you have anything that we need to add to this, if there's something I've missed, um, I would love to hear from you. If you have something that we need to be praying about, I would love to hear from you as well. Uh, as we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for hearing our prayer. You are the great and awesome God. You know what we need even before we think to ask. Thank you for giving us the awesome privilege and responsibility of approaching you in worship. We're thankful for the Lord's Supper. We're thankful for the ability to sing. We're thankful for the opportunity to pray, to come before your throne. We're thankful for the ability to give cheerfully. And we're thankful that we can hear the good news being preached. We pray that we might be able to share this good news with others. All of us have influence. And so we ask tonight that we might use our influence to teach others about who you are and what you've done for us. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you tonight in Jesus' name by his authority. Thank you, Father. Amen.